by law. So when, when we are contemplating this question of um, who is a citizen here or there, um, it becomes quite a significant issue. This is the same with Latin America. They, they had to grapple with who's a citizen, who was not, what are, what are the rights of citizenship, what are the good qualities of a citizen, who can become a citizen, can everyone become a citizen. Um, now, around the world there have been ways in which countries conceive of citizenship um, and limitations to citizenship. Sometimes they require you to be born there to acquire citizenship, for example, in Germany and Japan. Uh, but, you know, in, in countries that were colonies, how do you resolve this question of um, who is a citizen and who is not? Um, and so we're going to see what Latin America does. Um, we are going to maybe begin with this uh, brief timeline of um, some of the things that we've discussed. So, for example, um, the slave um, emancipation, emancipation of enslaved Africans in Haiti, declaration of empire, um, the beginning of the suppression of uh, slave trade. It's actually interesting that um, the slave trade is abolished in the U.S., um, so slave trade is abolished in 1808. Uh, the British also abolish um, slave trade around the same time. And but but what is abolished is a trade. It's not slavery itself. And as we saw with uh, Cuba and particularly Brazil, uh, slavery doesn't end, isn't abolished until 1888. And so the, the, we continue to see uh, slavery, but also um the active hunting down of slave ships um, but we also see these other issues that affect uh, Latin America so for example the uh, maybe not the uh, civil war in the United States but perhaps more of the uh, Mexican American war that takes um, almost half of Mexico um, yeah. Um, and then the uh, the war over Texas, so those kinds of things. But what we are mostly interested in is the um, is Latin America and the and the things that go on there. So, for example, abolition of slave trade in um, Cuba in 1886, and two years later in um, in in Brazil, but also the fall of the Brazilian Empire and some of um, the other developments in the region. And so all of these and other events elsewhere have some implication and uh, impact on race, relations, citizenship, and other developments in Latin America. Um, so we want to, broadly speaking, and it's important to see the influences of Europe on Latin America. After all, Latin America was European colonies. They, they, they were colonized by Europeans. And so we, we have to see those things happening in Europe as directly touching on those things happening in Latin America. Really good example is the um, Napoleonic Wars and the uh, relocation of the Brazilian kingdom to, uh, well, the relocation of the Portuguese kingdom to Brazil in 1807. Uh, but other things had an impact that was probably more nuanced. So for example, uh, the French National Constituent Assembly, so during the French Revolution, um, the French Assembly convenes and they issue uh, what they call the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. And again, you will see that this is about 13 years after the uh, U.S. Uh, Declaration of Independence. And so you, you actually begin to see the use of this language, not just in Europe and the U.S., but also in Latin America. But like the U.S., what does this mean? What does it mean to say that men are born equal, men are born and remain free and equal in rights? Um, Again, we, we should probably not have the point of it's it's an interpretation question. 
men are born and remain free in equine rights. So we are only talking about men. But you actually see some of the reflection of uh, French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, uh, the U.S. Declaration of Independence, but also um, the Enlightenment thought in writings of individuals such as uh, Rousseau, his writing of the uh, his uh, book, The Social Contract, the idea that we we consent to be governed. Now, this is also um, articulated by um, John Locke. Even though it is not very clear that we that there's a place where we actually consent to be governed. And a lot of the consent to be governed is often implied, uh, implied consent that we live in a country, we follow its laws, we take part in its processes, and therefore we have consented to being part of that society. But so we, we see, even though enlightenment wasn't such a big uh, deal or didn't have such a big impact in Latin America, we still see uh, the reflection on enlightenment thought and thinking about who has rights, but also who does not have rights. Um, now, what we see, especially in Latin America, is an end to the idea of rights that were obtained uh, by birth, basically where you, the station in which you were born influenced who you are, your rights, your privileges, your immunities, and so on. And so um, now we are moving more towards the idea that the citizen, like equality of all citizens, that you don't need to be born a certain way to have these um, rights. Um, so we, we see this beginning to permeate in Latin America. But also, again, as we as we have mentioned, uh, women and um, other groups are excluded. Now, in Latin America, of course, there are even more groups because what do you do with um, what do you do with the indigenous peoples? Do they have rights? Can they vote? Are they citizens? Um, and so these become really challenging issues, uh, particularly because women are generally excluded, but also most interestingly, and that is also true in the US, um, indigenous populations really didn't have uh, citizenship. I think the, um, in the case of the US, um, Native Americans became American citizens in like 1968, which sounds ironic because, you know, when people live on their land, you would think they would have been citizens uh, long before this, but um, such is the... Uh, so the, coming out of Europe, there was this idea of the universality of human rights, of citizenship. Uh, but the question is, was, even though we allude to universality of uh, human rights, and so if you actually <clears throat> look at what human rights are, you will see um, things like the right to citizenship, uh, the right to provide for yourself, freedoms, those kinds of things. So there's a theoretical um, freedom and equality before the law, but practically, you know, again, you go to the U.S. Declaration of Independence and it's sort of like all men are created equal, but then how do we define men? And the idea is that all these values remain valid, so you can't really, human rights are not, are not. Um, you can't take away human rights. They are there, they are not assigned by any states, they are guaranteed by states, so the state has a duty to ensure that they are not being violated. Um, and so when we sort of then extend this to freedom and equality, which are often um, products of local circumstances in, in the context of what people can do. So now this is straying probably too far, but think of um, Saudi Arabia and the idea that women cannot drive and it's sort of like, but, but they have human rights, they have freedom of movement, but the application is constrained 
Uh, but so we are looking at rights that are granted to citizens. Um, they are universal, but also the question of who a citizen is, this is something that um, most of the world has grappled with a lot. Um, there are still contestations depending on the context. So, for example, the U.S. has come up with the agreement that um, most uh, children born on the U.S. on U.S. soil are citizens. But again, there are limitations. So, for example, children of diplomats are not um, automatically citizens. So, we we see these gradations of what people are. Um, and so citizens, citizenship can be restricted. Human rights should not be restricted, even though the application are, is not necessarily uniform. And so when we think about um, how now countries actually apply human rights, we see um, that often they extend to only those who qualify. So for example, you will have things like to vote, you have to be a citizen. So uh, voting then is contingent upon uh, citizenship. But also we see the denial of rights based on a number of um, class, based on different um, um, attributes. So for example, class, gender, age, national origin, and race. Um, and so even though people might belong to the same language, religion or customs or share this, it is not necessarily the case that uh, rights and human rights were, at least not all of them, were um, extended to everyone. So, um, but what is the condition in, um, what are the conditions in majority of Latin America? So, this begins with who is instrumental in um, changing the conditions in Latin America? Who, le who is part of the struggle for liberation, for independence? In other words, who is a citizen and what can they do? What are their rights? So thinking about um, Latin America specifically, we see a lot of Creole um, and uh, basically disparate groups of um, the population, each with their own interests. So for example, we have mentioned that the um, um, enslaved Africans would participate in these uh, liberation movements because they were looking for independence. Um, the indigenous peoples often participated in these uh, wars of liberation on the side of European powers because they kind of liked uh, their situation. And so these opposing sides will then be the, um, the basis of citizenship. So what are these citizenships going, citi what is citizenship going to look like? Uh, who is going to have rights and who is going to be excluded? So, but again, what kinds of rights will people have? Um, so right to life, I think, is um, the most basic uh, human right. I, I don't know that you can have any rights to life. Uh, but the right to life is not everything. Um, there are other rights. So for example, the right to vote, um, right to run for office. And so these are primarily the uh, political rights. The right to choose one's rulers. Um, and so, again, if you compare with other places, for example, during until 1965, um, African Americans didn't have these rights. Uh, theoretically, they did, but then you add these other caveats and then it's, it's almost like, do they really have the rights? Um, other rights, so for example, right to free speech, freedom of religion, assembly, equality, equal treatment before the law. And again, we are not even just talking about the Latin American situation immediately after independence. Today, we still see um, some of these constraints. Um, so, you know, we have to keep in mind that um, just because rights are articulated doesn't mean that necessarily they 
come to the people um, to whom they are assigned. Now, other rights or claims to rights. So, in, and these have been discussions that have been going on uh, more recently. So, for example, the question of um, of uh, reparations, um, including some jurisdictions that have actually begun to implement them. But so, think about um, emancipated peoples claiming uh, recompense um, for the suffering and the um, exploitation that the well their ancestors went uh, through, and so even in Latin America we see this um, or agitating for a recompense for that suffering, and so often they 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 were um, I don't know if I should use the word allowed to. Um, obtain land, but also th there's, there's a lot of perhaps uh, unfulfilled promises, um, same as the US, we might recall. Uh, but so the, the ideas around uh, recompense or um, the reparations included, for example, land, uh, monetary Monetary remuneration and apologies. It's it's amazing to see that, for example, the U.S. did um, apologize ish for slavery, um, even though that was probably a half-hearted apology. But also the question is, was it enough, or uh, would it be more sufficient if? the 40 acres in a meal were given. And so you, you actually see a lot of this, including in Latin America. And so, for example, Urvina was very supportive of breaking up large estates so that the, um, the peasants and the formerly enslaved would be able to obtain, um, to obtain land so have a means of um, production and living. But also other things that we think are basic, for example, the right to pursue happiness, the right to life. Um, but also if you do not have access to property or you can't grow your own food, how do you assure that you have the right to life? Um, so. This is another group of uh, rights that uh, individuals agitated for, even in Latin America. But we also see um, the, so Latin American society was divided, actually very stratified, the large estate owners, but there were also lots of peasants, including the indigenous. And so um, there were demands, for example, for, um, village autonomy, land ownership. And again, you have to know that this land was often taken from um, indigenous peoples. And so how do they reclaim their land? And were they going to get all of the, uh, all of the land that was taken back? But so these are some of the issues that they, they were agitating for under the human rights regime. So in the citizenship um, question. So village autonomy, land ownership, the right to harvest or to preserve the, uh, um, the natural products. So for example, timber um, um, and the minerals. We actually still see this today. So for example, the Amazon forest has been largely cleared, cleared in this, you know, this, negatively affects the lives of uh, indigenous peoples. And so sometimes they are agitating for the right to life by preserving um, the natural habitat. So other things included, for example, water rights that have been um, had been enjoyed under the colonial rule. And if you recall, we mentioned that um, the colonial rule, because of the vastness of the and the complexity of some of those societies, um, mostly allowed, mostly kind of left um, native populations um, alone. 
uh, but so there were also questions of identity so what were these communities what did they think of themselves and so uh, what were the claims that they were making of the new state as communities or ex-Indian communities. But so we, we come to this major question that Latin America faces in the um, immediate post-independence period, like 1830s onwards, uh, the question of who was a citizenship, or rather who was a citizen? What were the desirable qualities of citizenship? Um, and what are, were the hierarchies that really influenced um, citizenship? Now, part of citizenship is the right to decide for yourself. Um, so, for example, should there be a national religion? Should you be forced to adhere to certain religions? Or is that a very strictly personal choice? Um, what were the how did the various identities, the hierarchies, the history um, intervene in determining citizenship? So, for example, how did religion affect citizenship? What were the social relations and what were the racial hierarchies? But also freedom from colonial rule. How did this translate into citizenship rights and what were these? Um, right. Now, there were even more questions. For example, would the enslaved be emancipated? And if yes, what would happen to labor? Now, we may take a good example of the question of emancipation from Haiti, actually, even the United States. So when Haiti first became independent or uh, slavery was abolished in 1793, um, it was discovered that uh, the formerly enslaved people that were now free um, did not, so Saint-Domingue or Haiti uh, produced about half of the world's sugar production by about 18, eh, about 1750. And so when you free the people who are compelled to produce the sugar, what happens to sugar production, but also what happens to um, the income that was brought about by sugar production. And so when you emancipate these people, what does that mean for production? Now, that sounds like a terrible argument because should we keep people enslaved so they produce sugar? Um, but also, um, the, the maybe majority black leaders of Haiti discovered um, that when people were emancipated, they started um, producing different things. So for example, they started farming on small plots, which broke up the large scale uh, production uh, farms. And, and so if I'm growing beans and my neighbor is growing corn, and um, that kind of disrupts the rhythm of production. Now, again, I cannot in good faith say that um, this was a bad thing because, you know, you, you can't, capitalism and, and slavery, um, those are two very different, well, actually the others, they, one dependent on the other, uh, but we cannot justify capitalism based on slavery. But so we, we, we have these questions of would the enslaved be emancipated and what would happen to the factories? And you actually have these same questions in the US uh, with the Civil War uh, and the aftermath. So would they have the same equal rights with the educated urban elite? Um, would the indigenous populations gain freedom? But also maybe we should ask the, op the, the maybe contra question, why would the indigenous populations not gain freedom. I mean, we ought to say they were already free um, and then discovered themselves to be colonized. So maybe that's a wrong question to ask. Um, what would happen to labor? Um, and so again, as I mentioned, the tributes kept the economy going. You have to, in other places, tributes are often known as um, heart taxes or poll taxes. 
you have to pay a certain amount of money to the government, so taxes. So would non-Spanish or Portuguese speakers have to learn Spanish or Portuguese? Now, again, we, we have these discussions going on today in this country, whether certain people should learn English and you know, those kinds of things. So what would happen to other languages? So, for example, all the other indigenous languages, which were more than probably 100, uh, how would the new countries deal with these languages? It's actually very interesting to see what um, South Africa did with the languages. So South Africa, after 1994, had 11 uh, official languages, which reflected the diversity of the population. But so these are, we are talking about maybe more than 150 years before this. So what would happen to these languages? Would they be eradicated? Would they be preserved? What would happen to the plebeian multitudes? So these are the maybe um, common people. What would happen to them? What of the mines, plantations, and cities workers? What would become of them? And again, these are not the, you know, the cream of society. But again, if you have liberation and people advocated for liberation based on equality, why were these even questions? Um, I mean, just give people freedom and see what would happen, even though sometimes that can turn out not very well. Um, were the illiterate and the unruly um, ready to be responsible citizens? Now again, the question is who decides what is unruly? But also are there illiterate people who are good citizens? And are there literate people who are just horrible citizens? So, um, the, but these were questions that you know, Latin America faced in the quest of deciding who is going to be um, the new citizens. But even more importantly now, again, and, and maybe Latin America is especially peculiar for one uh, thing that is probably more represented in Latin America than anywhere else. Uh, the idea of machismo, so men um, dominating public spaces, um, and the idea that women's place is in the home. Um, and you actually see a lot of this in, in many societies, including, for example, um, China, African societies. But women played very important and active roles um, in in uh, the liberation of Latin America. So, for example, if you think about Bolivar's companion, I forget her name, but um, she was really very instrumental in including in his travels, in um, his meeting with other junta leaders. But so women played very active roles in independence wars. They were combatants, co-conspirators, merchants, teachers, nurses, artisans, uh, financiers, defenders of social and cultural institutions. And so what would become the role of women in these new countries? Perhaps they only needed to look at um, the origin countries of Europe um, and um, the United States, for example, and figure out that maybe women were not going to have very good outcomes or at least were not going to be very much included in the uh, benefits of citizenship, particularly the uh, political rights to run for office, um, to vote and form political parties, those kinds of things. And so for the longest time, and I'm not necessarily sure that this is in, still the case today, uh, women in Latin America were seen as their place being in the home. Now, Latin America has um, actually uh, made some progress in political rights for women. So for example, Chile has had um, a female president. Um, Brazil has had a female president. Argentina, and I think there's one other country. Um, so clearly th there's been more progress than, uh, for example, the uh, United States. But so this was still in 1830s and 40s and 50s, these were still important questions 
I don't think there were questions, but um, so when we think about uh, the constitution of the new nation, um, this included the uh, embrace of universal liberal values, um, but also the, the, the values exist within a history of exclusion. So think about the out groups, the groups that didn't have power, the groups that were excluded um, versus the elites who, you know, decided on the rules. Um, and so when we think about the out groups in this case in, in Latin America and many other places, we are thinking about the formerly enslaved peoples, uh, women, indigenous peoples, the workers, the poor. Now, if you exclude all of this, the question then is, who are your citizens and, you know, can you tax formerly enslaved, the women, indigenous peoples and workers, if they are not participating in, in the full benefits of citizenship? Um, and so in theory, good political systems bind all the citizens. And the idea is that uh, the law protects all groups. Now, in the history of law, law hasn't, the law hasn't protected all groups or hasn't extended the same benefits to all groups the same way. Think about the 19th Amendment, a really good example of um, women not having the same um, rights, privileges, um, and so on. And so we, we see modern political systems as probably more um, fair, even though this is not necessarily without any criticism. Um, and so you, you actually begin to see these, these ideas of or expressed in the Brazilian statement that uh, for my friends, everything for my enemies, the law. So you can always find something in the law that will oppress your um, enemies. And so, you know, the new citizenship did not mean that the law protected you or give you uh, the rights and privileges um, that are due of um, all citizens. But also when we think about the, uh, the new nations, the new states and citizenship, we also see the lingering effects of um, the social stratification, social and racial and economic stratification. So for example, in Mexico, it is said there were about uh, 40 different classifications of people. So based on your ethnic um, composition, if I might put it that way. So Espanol, Castizo, Morisco, uh, Mestizo, Mulato, Indio, Negro. And of course, these are, these reflect the hierarchy of who was important and who was so sort of like, who is at the top there and who is kind of way down there. And so, for example, Espanol was the most desirable category um, or classification. Uh, the blacks, of course, were probably the, yeah, not probably, definitely, um, the least uh, or the, the lowest class. Um, and so this is often what was called castas or um, castes. So we, we think of castes as maybe in India, but also in Latin America. But so again, there were classifications based on different things like uh, race, color, physical features, occupation, wealth. But again, we have to think about the other example of the United States um, and the brown paper bag test. So these are things that kind of permeated um, some of these societies. And so more generally, we can see some groups that were widely panned and shunned and excluded. So for example, especially blacks who are very highly marginalized and they still are. Um, so yeah, and, and you know, even today you see some of these um, reflections there was a soccer match two days ago, maybe yesterday, the US playing Mexico and some of this actually came up. Um, but also there were specific and, and um, major efforts by government to reclassify people so that they were not, so you, you kind of didn't want to have so many 
black people you they were called Ladinos, uh, Spanish speakers who were of maybe a different color. Uh, but so again, these are classifications that continue to uh, imperial life in Latin America. Um, so, you know, when we think about uh, Latin America, we see gender rights uh, struggles continuing to the 20th century or 19th, well, 20th century. Um, but also the criticality of race case in uh, citizenship, uh, but also the numbers. And it's almost like these governments continue to just create this case. So for example, uh, colonial Mexico, where one lived, potential careers, opportunities for marriage, ability to participate in politics, all of these were determined by your race or your, your hierarchy, where you are classified. Now, of course, uh, for example, the whites were in many places um, classified as atop the hierarchies. So um, particularly the, um, the Espanols, so the, the Spaniards who came from Spain, but also these caused uh, schisms with the Creoles um, who were Europeans born in the Americas. Um, so I think we're going to stop here for now. Um, on